Okay, so how do we find admissible heuristics? Now, it, you know, so the straight line distance sort of makes sense. We should probably talk about the Manhattan distance heuristic. So let me see if we can look at this maze widget. So if I'm solving a maze, right, let's suppose I'm trying to solve a maze like this, but I know that I can earn each step I can go up, down, left or right. What would be a good heuristic for this maze? So I'm at a, I'm at a certain point and the goal, the goal is here and I'm somewhere else. What would be a good way to estimate the, the number of steps to the goal? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so one, one possibility is the straight line distance, right? If I'm here and I want to get here, if I measure the straight line distance, definitely that's an underestimate of the number of steps. But can we do better? Yeah. That's right. So a better example would be what's called the Manhattan distance. You look at, you pretend that you have to move at right angles. So you count the number of steps from here to here and then count the number of steps from here to here. Now, can everyone see that that's an underestimate of the true distance? Because at each step you either do, to get from here to here, at some stage I have to go down at least this many times and at some stage I have to go right at least this many times. I don't know in what order I'm going to do it, but I must make at least this many steps. Yep. And obviously it's called the Manhattan distance because it's when you're walking, you know, all the streets in Manhattan are in a rectangular grid. And the Manhattan distance is better in some sense. Right, so if you've got a choice between two heuristics, if it's less than the true distance, that's called admissible. So if you've got a choice between two admissible heuristics, you always want the one that's bigger of the two. Because the Manhattan distance is bigger, it gives you a better estimate. Okay, so now let's look at the eight puzzle. So if you remember what this is, you slide the tiles one at a time and you've got to get from here to this goal state. So what would be a good example of a heuristic? So in this case, how would you estimate the number of steps to get to the goal? For each place, yeah. how many uh, tiles to the right place? I'm going to look at two different heuristics. So the, that's, a, that's, the better, that's the best heuristic, yeah. A simpler heuristic, but not as good would be to say, just count how many tiles are out of place. You know, tile two is in its correct place, but tile one isn't. If you look, tiles one, three, four, five, seven, and eight. So there's six tiles that are in the wrong place, so that, it, with each move, only one tile moves apart from the blank, so I need to make at least six moves to get to the goal, okay? So that is an underestimate, but it's a very, very poor estimate. A much better estimate would be, let's, so let's look at this number one. So somehow this one has to get from here up to there. So what's the minimum number of moves that would be required? Four, because that's the Manhattan distance. So we don't know which path it's going to, it might go this way, it might go this way, it might go this way. We don't know which path it's going to take, but one way or another, it has to move left twice and up twice at least. It could be worse. It might have to come backwards at some point. We must move the one tile at least four times. The two tiles are already in its, uh, in its correct place. The three has to move three times. The four has to move three times. And you can calculate for all the others. Five has to move once. Six is okay. 7 has to move twice and 8 has to move once. Yeah, it's a very good question. So the thing is like 2, you can kind of make an argument that it actually, yeah. I know what you're saying. 14, you could probably argue it's got to be at least, you know, 16 or something. But how the, the heuristic starts to get more... How do you know that 2 has to move? Well, it's because... Yeah, I guess it does have to move, yeah. Because 7, otherwise... It has adjusted numbers to it, which are yeah. in the incorrect places. If all of them were incorrect places, then... Yeah. 
So that's good. But the thing is, could you codify that? You want to, this is the thing, it's not just one position. We want to be able to quickly calculate a heuristic from any position. The goal state is fixed. But we want to calculate a heuristic from any start state to the goal state. Yeah. So there's a trade-off between how, how good is the heuristic but how long does it take to calculate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now what happens in this case, this actually dominates this. So this H2 is always bigger than H1, right? At least as big. So in that case, if, if H2 is always bigger than H1, we say that H, and both are admissible, then we say H2 dominates H1. So it's always better, in that case, it's always better to use H2 instead of H1. This is some old results for the 14 and the 24 puzzle. And what you find is, if you do iterative deepening search for the 14 puzzle, it may take three million nodes for a particular start state. For the same start state, A star may <laughs> reduce it to 500. So you can sometimes get a huge speed up with A star search. And you notice moving from H1 to H2, gives you a little bit of extra benefit. In this case, not much benefit. But for the 24 puzzle, this was 54 billion. Here it reduces it from 40,000 to 1,600. Well, that's a pretty big speed up. So this is what I'm saying about the brinkmanship. The idea is to get as close to the true <coughs> path cost as possible, but ne not exceeding it. Now, how would we find heuristics for other puzzles? Well. One way to think about these heuristics here is well, it often happens that an admissible heuristic is derived from the exact solution by a simplified or reduced, relaxed version of the problem. So what do we mean by that? Well, we remove some of the rules. So in the eight puzzle, let's say I change the rules and say, okay, so normally the rule is that the puzzle, the tiles are not allowed to slide on top of each other. But if I say, okay, I'm going to remove that restriction and the tiles can slide on top of each other, this is actually exactly how many moves it would take to solve that relaxed version of the puzzle. Because you could move the one over the top of all of these and then move the three and so on and you could solve it in this number of moves. So you've, by removing the restriction, you can get a, a heuristic for the original puzzle. And the total missed pace tiles, well, that's even more relaxed. That's saying, I'll oh, bugger it, I'll just, I can just move this from, I don't even have to move it one step at a time. I, I'm just allowed to move, pick up a tile and move it anywhere. And it can be on top of another tile. If that was the rule, then it would only take me six moves to solve the puzzle. So often we look for relaxed versions of the puzzle. Now, another trick is this. In this case, one heuristic dominated the other, but sometimes we have two heuristics which are both admissible, but neither of them dominates the other. So in some cases, heuristic one is bigger, and in other cases, heuristic two is bigger. If we have multiple heuristics like that, we can actually make a composite heuristic by just maximizing the, taking the maximum of all of them. And it turns out that if the original heuristics are all admissible, then the combined heuristic will also be admissible, and it dominates all of the others. So this is now where we get to Rubik's Cube. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> solving this during the break. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. This is a puzzle that was very popular when I was in high school. I had the privilege of meeting Erno Rubik on a visit to Hungary once. I've actually got a picture of him on the course website. But yeah, this was, it was a big craze and um, one of my schoolmates, he, he told me um, he was sitting on the bus one day and these two girl, he heard these two girls behind him talking about Rubik's Cube and they were up to the point where they were only, they could, they were just, they could solve one side. And one girl was saying, oh, yeah, I'm really having trouble doing this. And the other girl was saying, you know, that's because blue is supposed to be the hardest side to get. <laughs> 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 Try to get the green side, <laughs> that's much easier. 
All right, so what kind of heuristic would you come up with for Rubik's Cube? Let's suppose, uh, how can you make an estimate of the number of moves to get from a particular state to the goal state? What ideas would you have? Mm. It's tricky. I know, this is really tricky. Well, you know, the signs are always facing the left. <coughs> like when you right, so these little... When you look at the mechanics of the thing, the centers of these, so for the three by three cube at least, these centers are always correct. They just spin around on their own <laughs> axis. So you don't have to worry about that. So well, let's, let's look in more detail. What is the, okay, so apart from the centers, we have these small little cubes. So really you've got to think not in terms of the stickers, but in terms of the actual little cubes. So how many little cubes are there? <laughs> well, there's two types of little cube, right? The corners, what, what, the corners there's corners and edges. edges. How many corners are there? Eight corners and how many edges? Twelve. Twelve edges and eight corners, right? So that's 20 altogether, is that right? Okay. So what you might, you might first think in relation to the eight puzzle. You might think that, um, how, many the how many cubes are in the wrong place? Exactly. But then the problem with that is, every time I do a move, how many of these, so I could actually think, I could try to think of the Manhattan distance for each little cube. For each little cube, I could try to figure out what's the minimum number of moves to get that cube into the right place. And that's like a three-dimensional Manhattan distance. Okay, but the problem with that is, it's a good first attempt, but the problem is, whenever I do a move, I'm actually moving eight cubes. So if I added all that up, I'd have to get an admissible heuristic, I'd have to divide by eight. Right, so that it's, it does give an admissible heuristic, but it's not that good, okay? Now, it turns out a better heuristic is to forget about the corners and only look at the edges. I could say, for each edge, I could calculate how many moves it would take to get that edge in the right place, and then I only need to divide by four, because only four edges move with each turn. Yeah, and that would give me an admissible heuristic. Of course, website. But yeah, this was, it was a big craze, and um, one of my schoolmates, he, he told me, um, he was sitting on the bus one day, and these two girl, he heard these two girls behind him talking about Rubik's Cube, and they were up to the point where they were only, they could, they were just, they could solve one side. And one girl was saying, oh, yeah, I'm really having trouble doing this, and the other girl was saying, you know, that's because blue is supposed to be the hardest side to get. <laughs> 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 Try to get the green side. <laughs> it's much easier. <laughs> All right, so what kind of heuristic would you come up with for Rubik's Cube? Let's suppose, uh, how can you make an estimate of the number of moves to get from a particular state to the goal state? What ideas would you have? It's tricky. I know, this is really tricky. Well, you know, the signs are always facing the left. <coughs> like when you right, so these little, when you look at the mechanics of the thing, the centers of these, so for the three by three cube at least, yeah. these centers are always correct. They just spin around on their own <laughs> axis. So you don't have to worry about that. So well, let's, let's look in more detail. What is the, okay, so apart from the centers, we have these small little cubes. So really, you've got to think not in terms of the stickers, but in terms of the actual little cubes. So how many little cubes are there? <laughs> well, there's two types of little cube, right? What, what, there's corners and edges. How many corners are there? Eight corners and how many edges? Twelve. Twelve edges and eight corners, right? So that's 
20 altogether, is that right? Okay. So what you might, you might first think in relation to the eight puzzle. You might think that, um, How many cubes are in the wrong place? Exactly. But then the problem with that is every time I do a move, how many of these? So I could actually think, I could try to think of the Manhattan distance for each little cube. For each little cube, I could try to figure out what's the minimum number of moves to get that cube into the right place. And that's like a three dimensional Manhattan distance. Okay, but the problem with that is, it's a good first attempt, but the problem is whenever I do a move, I'm actually moving eight cubes. So if I added all that up, I'd have to get an admissible heuristic, I'd have to divide by eight, right? So that it's, it does give an admissible heuristic, but it's not that good, okay? Now, it turns out a better heuristic is to forget about the corners and only look at the edges. I could say, for each edge, I could calculate how many moves it would take to get that edge in the right place. And then I only need to divide by four. Because only four edges move with each turn. Yeah, and that would give me an admissible heuristic. Now here's the thing. We can use this trick of composite heuristics. So. I could look at the edge, for any given position, I could look at the edges, and I could calculate the Manhattan distance for the edges, and then divide by four, but then I could do the same thing for the corners. So that gives me heuristic H1. And then I could do the same trick with the corners. For each corner, I could calculate the Manhattan distance. I add all that up and divide by four, that gives me H2. And then I can take the maximum of H1 and H2. So that's a good idea. But when they tried to code this up, it turns out that the corners actually don't give you much extra benefit. That the edges, the edge heuristic is actually much better, and the corner heuristic only gives you a little bit of extra benefit, and it's not worth the extra computation. What is a corner in the right place, but it's current? current right. So yeah, there's a good question. So what if the so I what if the corner is in the right place but turned? I think we would want to work, we would want to estimate we would want the number of moves to get it actually not just in the right place but in the right orientation as well. So we would have to include the moves to turn it around. So there's this famous paper by Korf from 1997. He this was the first time that people actually managed to find minimal length solutions for Rubik's. So, yeah, there's these books that tell you how to solve Rubik's Cube and it works every time, but it doesn't give you the minimum, it doesn't solve it in the minimum number of moves. But this was the first time they were able to do it in the minimum number of moves and it's actually a very clever idea. So this is what he did. He said, well, let me look at the corners, <coughs> but let me not look at it. So I forget the edges and just look at the corners, but I'm not going to look at every corner individually. I'm going to look at all the corners together. So I start, with some, I start with some state and I look at all the corners together. Now, if I, let's suppose that I, my aim was just to solve the corners and not the edges, then it would be a simpler version of the puzzle. It would be the same as like the two by two by two Rubik's Cube. So now the two by two by two Rubik's Cube is actually simple enough that you can store the whole thing in memory. I think the number of states is about three million. So he says, okay, let's pre-compute the search space for the two by two by two Rubik's Cube. I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna generate all three million states for the two by two cube and I'm gonna by brute force uh, breadth first search I'm gonna figure out for each of those three million states, how many moves it would require to solve the puzzle, right? So that means that for any given state in the, once I've done that, that takes some time to compute that, but it's, then I store it somewhere and I have it as a pattern database. So then for any starting position of the three by three cube, 
I can look up in that table and I can find out exactly how many moves it would take me to, to get the corners. How many moves it would take me to get all the corners in the right place. Does everyone follow? Yeah. So they store that away and that's, a, that's an admissible heuristic, right? Because it's got to take me at least that many turns to get the whole cube. Ah, very good. Well, then he does the same thing for the edges. Now, the problem with the edges, there's 12 edges. So if you, can, if you consider all edges together, it's too big. The search space is too big. So he arbitrarily divides the edges into two. He, looks, he divides it into six edges and six other edges. And he says, okay, for these six edges, I'm going to pre-compute how many moves it would take to get those, to sol to get those, six edges in the right place. And then he takes the other six edges and I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> so he's got three, so for any given position, he's got three different databases. So he's got one number that tells him how long it would take to get the corners, one number that tells him how long it would take to get six, a specified subset of six edges, and one number that says the other edges. Right? Is everyone following this? And he takes the maximum of those three numbers. So it's a very clever, it's a very clever approach because those num those those heuristics complement each other well. There may be some some positions where the corners are where the edges are all correct but not the corners. So one heuristic is doing much better than the other, and vice versa. There may be positions where the corners are all correct but not the edges. So he takes those three, he takes the maximum, and then that's the heuristic that he uses. <laughs> then he uses A star search with that heuristic to solve the cube. Now it's sti you still run out of memory. There's still, you st I mean, at least in 1997, they didn't have enough memory uh, to do this. It probably might be still the case today. So this is where they switch to this iterative deepening A star search. Yeah. Good.